Good day Westview and welcome to worship. This spring, come along and join us for our new preaching series called Life Hacks, where we're going to work our way through the book of Proverbs. As we navigate our way through life, there's more than enough information available to us. So we don't need more of that, but we do yearn for wisdom, those soul truths that act as our true north. Are you looking for an avenue of service at the church? Do you have an eye for detail? Would you like to see the services flow smoothly? If that sounds like you, come along and join us on Sunday the 28th of August after the second service where we'll be hosting a multimedia workshop. For more information, contact James at the church office or have a look at the website. A reminder to all our new members who have joined Westview since the 6th of March this year. Foundation, our online new members course, starts this Tuesday and runs till the 13th of September from 8 to 9 p.m. on Zoom. Get in touch with the church office to confirm your attendance and to send in your completed new members form so that we have the correct details for sending you the link. For more information, contact the church office or comms, C-O-M-M-S, at westview.org.za. Hello friends and welcome into this online space of worship. We gather from different places and even at different times to worship God, but we are bound together as a community by the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love that bounds us together as one. Um, as we prepare to worship, I want to invite you to, to bring all that you know of yourself, bring your fears and your joys, bring your regrets and disappointments, but also your achievements Bring your, your thoughts and your feelings. Bring all that you know of yourself to, to all that you know of God. To all that you know of God's grace and God's mercy and God's power, God's presence. And, uh, and, and as we do so, let us pray together. God of creation. God of the cross. God who is ever present. We come before you in worship, bringing all that we know of ourselves to all that we know of you and who you are. We trust at this place where our lives meet your gaze, that your grace would flood into our lives as we surrender ourselves to you. Amen. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never f
Though we run hot and cold, fickle and changing in our faith, O God, your love remains certain and constant. Though we grow tired and disillusioned, bored and distracted far too easily, your love stays true to the end. Though we allow our grief and anger to turn us away from grace and mercy, your love refuses to let go. We praise and thank you, O God, for your relentless love for its abundant availability, and for so flooding our lives with love that some must inevitably overflow and warm others with its touch. We long to love as we have been loved. We long for a world that is filled and changed by your love, God. And yet too often our attempts to love get derailed, we confess that we do not love as freely, easily, and indiscriminately as you do. And we confess that in our struggle to love, we hurt you, ourselves, and our families, friends, and neighbors. In your love and grace, forgive us, and give us the loving power of your Spirit, so that we may be true lovers of God and others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello Westview, our reading today is from Matthew 7, verse 12 to 20. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people be grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. We thank God for his word. It was the year 1867 when a British open air missionary, a guy by the name of Gavin Kirkham, uh, whilst attending a conference in the Netherlands, chanced upon a painting by a German artist named Charlotte Reichlin. So taken by the painting was Kirkham, so struck by its power that he commissioned a copy of it uh, a copy that stood four meters tall and three meters wide. Kirkham uh, traveled around the British Isles with this painting. He would display the painting and he spent his time as a missionary using the painting as a springboard from which to preach the gospel of Christ, calling people to repent and to surrender their lives to Jesus. The title of the painting is The Broad and Narrow Way. The Broad and Narrow Way. It is based on our study passage today, specifically on verse 13 and 14 of Matthew chapter 7. And the painting has a very clear structure. In, in the foreground uh, at the bottom of the painting is, is a wall which has two entr entrances. The, the one to the left is, is wide uh, open. 
and the entrance to the right is a narrow gateway. A signpost between the two openings has two arrows on it. One points to the left and it says death and destruction. And the other points to the right and it says life and bliss. Uh, a street preacher stands in the painting before the, the narrow gate, inviting people through it. And then on the other side of the wall, uh, a path, uh, a wide path meanders up the hill from the wide gate. It is a, it is a path which is lined with an inn or a bar, uh, with a gambling house, uh, with a, a theater. And the path ultimately leads to the top of the hill where there is a city on fire, an inferno, and it is Babylon uh, on, on, on fire. The, the, the narrow path on the, the right side of the canvas, that path winds its way past the cross and past the Sunday school and past a children's rescue center and, uh, and leads ultimately to the heavenly, heavenly Jerusalem up on the hill as it is depicted in the book of Revelation. I've no doubt that God used that painting to bring many people in straight-laced Victorian England uh, to salvation. But I have to be honest and, and, and say to you that, uh, that as a whole, the, the painting kind of has an unintended negative consequence. For me, and perhaps for you as well, the painting creates the impression that Christianity is at heart a long list of do's and don'ts. The list of don'ts include items such as don't drink, don't uh, gamble, uh, don't go to the theater. In fact, best to avoid anything that might lead to too much fun. Because ultimately those things will lead to the fiery place. The list of do's includes going to church and uh, attending small group and helping the destitute. Do these things, the painting says to me, and you'll make it to the heavenly Jerusalem. But ultimately, it says to me that Christianity is all about do's and, and don'ts, uh, with threat and rewards depending on which choice you make. Over 150 years now, after Charlotte Reichland painted The Broad and Narrow Way, I believe that there are many people, many people, both inside and outside of Christianity, but perhaps particularly outside of Christianity, um, who still believe that to be a Christian is to be rule-bound, to be restricted. Uh, some would say repressed, to go through life on a narrow path, being narrow-minded. Uh, many people believe that Christians are people who see things as right and wrong, black and white, with a desirable path, a standard one-size-fits-all kind of prescription. It might be a, a, a road that, that leads, in Jesus' words, to life, or in Ryan's words, to life and bliss. But the process of getting there doesn't sound too life-affirming, does it? So this morning, I want to invite you just to cast aside uh, that painting and, uh, and perhaps the negative consequences of what it might depict. And I want to invite you to return with me now to the actual words that Jesus spoke about the wide and narrow path and gates. Let's push aside any preconceived notions about what Jesus was talking about. Let's do some good old-fashioned Bible study. Uh, exegesis is the term the theologians use. And let's understand what Jesus was inviting us to when he invited us to enter into the narrow gate and to walk along the narrow path. This is the first thing I invite you to notice about Jesus' words in Matthew 7. Notice that the, 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 the narrow way is the golden rule. The narrow way is the golden rule. We realize what Jesus meant by the narrow way when we remove the paragraph headings that were inserted by the Bible translators and, and read the text as it was originally written. The paragraph headings kind of help us to slice up Jesus' teachings into bite-sized chunks, but, uh, but sometimes they separate out verses that should in fact be read together. Listen to Jesus in verse 12 in the first half of verse 13 when we put these verses together. Jesus says, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. 
Do you see how when we read Jesus' words about the narrow gate in this way, when we read them in their context, we see that the, the narrow gate and the, the narrow way that Jesus uh, refers to is in fact the, the golden rule. It is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this, says Jesus, is the path that leads to life. This uh, is the path that leads you to living a life that has meaning and joy and peace. Uh, this is the path that leads you to living your life such that your life is life-giving to other people as well. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. This is the narrow path. Throughout this preaching series, we've been using the analogy of a hike in the mountains to describe the Christ-following life. And, and recently, when my family and I were holidaying in the Eastern Cape, we, we did a, a day hike to the beautiful hole in the wall. It was easy when we first set out on the hike not to get lost because there was a very clear path up the hill that we needed to follow. There was thick grassland on either side of the path and, uh, and a clear dirt path that led in the direction through the grassland towards the, in the direction that we knew we needed to go in. But when we got to the top of the hill, we got to an area um, where cattle grazed. And, uh, and our lovely clear path through the grassland was replaced by myriad different paths crisscrossing through the grassland. The, the myriad paths had been made by the cattle as they wandered about grazing um, on the grassland. And, and, and because there were many paths, it was difficult to figure which path was the right one that we needed to take. In, in a sense, the, the road before us was, was wide. Uh, with many different routes that we could have taken, but we had no way of knowing which one would ultimately get us to our destination. So when Jesus talks about choosing the narrow and the wide paths, Jesus is saying to us, life is filled with many different options, and the wide path presents many different choices. And Jesus is saying, each one of you, each one of us, must choose a path, a defining philosophy, which is going to guide you through life. Is your philosophy going to be just have fun, which in, in my observation is a, is a path that doesn't ultimately satisfy and ultimately lead to life? Is your path or philosophy going to be climb the ladder of success? And in my observation, whichever wall you prop up that ladder against, however you define climbing the ladder of success, climbing the ladder of success doesn't lead to life with a capital L. Is your philosophy going to be, do whatever feels right? Uh, well, we need to be careful of trusting our feelings. Our feelings can mislead us and deceive us and lead us astray. And so Jesus says uh, in, in the sermon on the essentials of living, he says, let me tell you what is the path that leads to life for you and your neighbor. What is going to lead to life for you and your neighbor is this, do unto others as, uh, as you would have them do unto you. And, and what does Jesus mean by the wide gate that, that leads to the, the wide road that, that leads on to destruction? Well, the wide, wide way is, is living life in a way, in any way that takes us off the path of doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. And this is where Charlotte Reichlein's painting contains some truth. We, we know that gambling halls in Victorian England led to the destruction of many families as, as men, and it was mostly men who were breadwinners, as they gambled away their wages and left their families to starve. And of course, the, the hunger for riches that comes from becoming addicted to games of chance is, is a selfish rather than a selfless desire. Equally, the abuse of al alcohol that is depicted by the inn. Uh, the abuse of alcohol often leads people to act in, in unloving ways, whether it be through drunken violence or through marital infidelity or through driving under the influence in a way that endangers the lives of others. That's not the way that leads to life. So, so in this sense, the painting contains truth. Many of the markers along right lines wide path are, are indeed indicators of of ways of living outside of love for others, ways of living which lead to pain and regret and a broken community and destruction. But it's not about journeying through life carrying a long list of do's and don'ts in your pocket. That's not what the Jesus life is about. It's more like carrying a compass in your pocket 
and taking it out every now and then to figure out which way true north is. And so this item that we're carrying with us today in our Jesus Essential series is just that. It's a, it's a compass. It's a reminder to us that the narrow path that you and I to call walk upon is the way of love. Love is our true north. The law of love guides us in which way we should walk. Now in our reading, didn't Jesus, did, Jesus didn't only talk about the, <clears throat> the, the narrow and the wide way, did he? Um, he also talks about true and false prophets. And so let's turn our attention, let's move on now to look at Jesus' verses about words about true and false prophets. Let's read them again. Verse 15 and 16, Jesus says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Notice that Jesus is not talking here about false teachings and true teachings. This is not a warning about what is heresy and what is orthodoxy. No, Jesus is, is, is talking here instead about good fruit and bad fruit. I love the way that Eugene Peterson paraphrases uh, the words of Jesus in the message. Listen to how he puts it. He says, be wary of false preachers who smile a lot, dripping with practiced sincerity. Chances are they're out to rip you off some way or other. Don't be impressed with charisma. Look for character. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions or your pocketbook. These diseased trees with their bad apples are going to be chopped down and burned. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of listening to somebody speak or preach who, who claims to be a man or woman of God, who has enough charisma to sell ice to Eskimos. And that charisma may even make them popular. They may even have a, a large following which only adds to the aura around them. But, but you listen to them and the thought pops into your head, something like, this person doesn't ring true. It, it feels like what I'm seeing and listening to is a show. It feels like there's something else going on behind the facade. What I'm listening to doesn't feel authentic. It doesn't feel like the real deal. And so Jesus invites us to, to prioritize character over charisma in discerning who it is that we should listen to and follow. You see, the followers of Jesus place a high value on integrity. We should be careful not to be taken in by sweet or flattering words or words that offer false hope. True prophets, true leaders, and isn't our world crying out for true leaders today? are those who, who walk their talk. Uh, they're not like those apples which are red and shiny on the outside and then we bite into them and yuck, they're all soft and mushy and, and yellowy on the inside. Uh, the, the true leaders that we are to follow are those that produce good fruit. They speak God's truth with pure motives and there is integrity between what they say and what they are. Okay, friends, I want to pull all of this together by, by pointing you to this truth. Walking in Jesus' narrow way leads to expansive living. Walking in Jesus' narrow way leads to expansive living. You know, when Holly and I and the kids uh, uh, did that walk to Hole in the Wall, we, we had to pick our way through the myriad cow paths and, to be honest, also through the myriad cow pats. And... Uh, and, and, and eventually we found that one true path again, the singular path that led us to our destination. And after walking a little further along that path, we, we crested another hill and, and we looked down upon one of the most spectacular views that I have seen in my life. The magnificent rock formation of hole in the wall rising out of the pounding surf with the wild ocean spreading to the horizon far beyond it. And here's the thing about that narrow path that we walked along. It didn't lead us to a narrow life, to a restricted life. In fact, it led to its opposite. That narrow path led to expansive vistas. It led to wild adventures. It led to new experiences. It, it led to broadened horizons. 
And, and this is true of the way of love. That we walk in the way of love for God, of love for others, of love for ourselves, and of love for creation. That determination to remain on that narrow path leads to the, the joy of expansive vistas and the thrill of wild adventures and the awe of broadened horizons. And this, friends, is what Jesus means when he says that narrow is the way that leads to life. Now I'm going to hand over to John. He's going to lead us in a, in a time of reflection and response to these powerful words of Jesus. Thank you, Ian, for calling us back to the way of Jesus, the way of love. Now, friends, as we receive God's call and we respond to it, let's use a spiritual practice that we perform all the time, the offering. We give as an act of thanksgiving for God's love and generosity. But we also give as an act of love toward others. The gifts we bring support ministries that bring healing, comfort and practical support to people in need in our community. And so giving is one of the simplest and most practical ways we can share God's love widely and generously. I invite you to take a moment in silence to give thanks for God's generosity. And then invite the Spirit to guide you in your giving. And pray for those who will be served through your gift. Then when you're ready and when Westview's bank details come onto the screen, you can make your offering mindfully and thankfully in response to the grace and love that you have received from God in your life. So let's be still for a while. And now let's bring our offering as an act of worship. Let's pray. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we come before you today just with great thankfulness for, for everything that we've been given, for everything that we've been blessed with in our lives. Lord, we pray today that everything that we bring before you, all these tithes and offerings, our gifts, our talents, that you just take it, you bless it, that it's acceptable unto your sight, that it can just be used to further your kingdom, to do your will, your good and gracious will, on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that you can just bless us as we go out into the world, as we take in what we learn today, that we can just do the best that we can, that we can do your will, that we can be people who live lives, who live changed lives, so that we can go out into the world and do to others as we would have them do unto us, to help benefit and grow the world in accordance with your will and to grow your kingdom. Pray all of this in your great and holy name. Amen. Stronger than a fist. Wonder. 
Now as we bring the service to a close, let's share God's love with each other as we speak these words of blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Let's go into this week with thanksgiving for God's love toward us and with a commitment to share that love as freely and generously as we can. Thanks for sharing in this worship gathering. Have a love-filled week and God bless you.